Hello, everybody. Welcome to Musicians Roundtable. This is our first installment of something that I've been working on a long time. And the idea came about through Facebook and other internet uh, social media to have live conversations with outstanding creative musicians from anywhere in the world that we can share live and even invite audience participation with questions and so forth. So today is our first uh, episode, and I'm really pleased that our guest is uh, Ben Saalfeld. Ben is an internationally renowned lutenist uh, from England, and uh, let's get going. So, hey, Ben, how are you doing now? Hi, Jeffrey. It's great to be here. This is an amazing technology because I am in Los Angeles on a sweltering, humid kind of uh, s summer day here. And what is it like in Cornwall where you are? Yeah, yes, we're, we're sort of, well, we've got, um, we're an early evening and, and the sun's starting to go down. And you're, I know you're on the Pacific coast and we're on the Atlantic coast or I'm on the Atlantic coast and it's, it's very beautiful. I think the exact opposite in, in many ways to Los Angeles, although beautiful in a more urban way, should we say, where you are, but uh, very, very opposite, which is kind of fitting. Absolutely. I know from uh, messages that I received that right now there are literally people in several continents of the world who are tuning in. And I'm particularly uh, grateful and happy that some of the people in Australia are looking in. It's 5 a.m. in Australia on Monday morning, and it really is, it really is a testament to people's passion for music that uh, that we have some of these people there. I, I hope they get to go to work later in the day rather than earlier, Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> 5 a.m. Well, so Ben is a lutenist, a lutar player an amazing performer, concert performer, and also is, has authored many books and many more books are coming online, which will be a contribution not only to all the lute world, but also to classical guitarists, because there's a great need for outstanding scholarly editions that are informed by players who, uh, a player in this case, Ben, who really has access to great taste in musicianship and original scholarships and so uh, scholarship for all the different manuscripts from which this yeah. music comes. <laughs> Can we take you up on your offer to play a little bit of that if, or any piece that you wish that's a Renaissance piece? <laughs> Yeah, you can, you can certainly, you, you certainly can. Um, but you'll have to give me about 25 seconds. During the 25 seconds, yes, that's fine. That's great. During the um, Renaissance and Baroque, all performers had um, more than 25 seconds to bring their act together. But I think nothing could be better than what we have now. <laughs> This was a totally, a totally unexpected uh, addition to my evening. You said it was fine to have cocktails, Jeffrey. <laughs> yes, sure. Why not? Right, I'm going to uh, play you a little something on the on the lutar. I'm actually in a in a baroque tuning at the moment, so I'm going, I'm going to finish finish getting that down while Jeffrey continues talking. Yes, I'm looking at this amazing instrument. And Ben starts to play, um, one of the things that they have not, um, that they've not put together really for this is good audio transmission live. 
so there will be some distortion, but I think you get a, a bit of an idea of the lutar. <laughs> So, so really what you want me to do is to lay my headset on, on the instrument at the same time as I'm concentrating on playing. <laughs> that's, think, isn't, isn't that what De Milano always did? Is he, I, I think, yeah, I, I, think, I think he said that the, the last time he emailed me, actually. So, ah. I'll, play, I'll play you a little, uh, a little Dowden, shall I? Sure. Great. See if you can guess which piece this is, Jeffrey. take a wild guess my first thought <laughs> was it was um stairway to heaven but <laughs> my second guess is the lady hunston's pub uh, you're quite and right i love the i love the elizabethan titles for music you actually don't even have to play a lot of the music you can be you can get in a really fabulous mood just by looking through the loot books and just reading the titles and savoring all these amazing things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think what my favorite title is probably of, of the Dowden ones in particular is the most high and mighty Christianus the fourth, King of Denmark, his Galliard. I just think, yeah, high and mighty, I like that. I, I, want, that to was... be high, I want to be high and mighty, Jeffrey. Can you arrange that for me? Um, <laughs> we're working on it. I think that he was probably uh, applying for a job with that particular piece. You're, you're not wrong, actually. He got the job as well. <laughs> That's the funny thing. So, so yeah. he had the proper <laughs> obsequious approach. Um, I, I always liked my lady, um, I think there's one called Mrs. Vo's Nothing. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Mistress White's Nothing. The, the nothing, you see, the toy is a bit like a nothing. And nothing in a toy. They're, they're both just short or insignificant pieces in the Renaissance. So and nothing. It just brings to mind the fact that it's just a, a little sort of collection of, it's a ditty. It's a little chilled out thing that you play and you've named it after this person and they're pleased about it and everything's good and life is rosy. You know, that's the sort of uh, attitude behind the nothing, I think, <laughs> or the puff. Since you have the lutar in hand, mm -hmm. would you talk about how you got started with the lute and then just give a capsulized uh, history of how the lute developed into uh, you working with the lutar and what is the lutar? That whole background would be great. Yes, the, the, uh, the lute um, was the instrument I played for 
exclusively for 25 years. I started in 1984 on December the 11th, in fact, my 13th birthday. And uh, I, I took very well, pretty much like a duck to water to, to lute playing. My brother's younger brother's guitar teacher was primarily a lutenist in his early days. And I didn't want to be the third guitarist in the in the family, and so I I I, he, I took up the loop when he suggested it, and it, and it worked very well. And I played that uh, my first loop for I think three two or three years before finding the loop that I would eventually play as a concert instrument uh, for many years, which I have. A, I, I'm going to show you the the, the loop um, in a few minutes um, because I, I brought it from the other side of town. She, she's she's in sort of semi retirement now. Um, and then, uh, after being destroyed on three occasions and re being rebuilt, um, it was time for the for the lute to really to be replaced by um, an instrument that was hardier and 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 so I decided to go for a different approach to music. And, and I, I thought to myself, what is the? I'd, I'd just been involved in in all this sort of writing of the the Vice book. And uh, I'd noted that he'd complained about how the, there weren't the right instruments to play the galantry, the, the minor dance forms in the sonatas. And, and I remember thinking, yeah, this is the same with, in my opinion, with lutes, is that they're fantastic instruments, that everything about them is right, but they have these really, really dodgily low tension deep basses and and when you're trying to play for a large audience and and you want to you know really sort of go for it on your basses you can't you have to be careful all the time be, be very careful um, and i wanted to design um an instrument that would work um and would have been the instrument of choice i think of, of the renaissance that I, that I could use in concert touring, that would be hardy, that would have a, a larger sound, but still retain the sweetness of the lute. And so um, a friend of mine who's also a very great um, a guitar maker, Kiff Wood, who, who's down in, in what we call the far west, I'm up north in Truro, which is about uh, 40 miles from Land's End. Um, and he's down west, which means he's about 10 miles from Land's End. Um, and so I went down west to see Kiff, and we spent we spent some some weeks working on uh, a design of an instrument, starting with the sound that we wanted to develop, and then working the, the look around uh, the sound afterwards and around convenience. So we went for something that looks a bit like a bit like a guitar. It's got this, but with a very narrow waist. Um, it's also semi-acoustic. So when they call me to play uh, Wembley Stadium. Um, I can do that. Um, and we have these American, you'll be glad to hear American, Jeffrey, um, pegs, which actually have a gearbox mechanism inside. I don't know if you can see those. Um, and uh, it's 10 courses. Uh, the first six strings on here are single and the rest are, are paired with octaves. Um, and the sound is, because of the way it was developed, the acoustic development is something like 30 or 40 percent louder than a classical guitar in the average concert hall from what we can uh, get, uh, gather and unlike a lute amplifies really really easily and really well plug her in get your stack marsh lamps and away you go and uh, you, don't, you actually don't lose quality of sound unless you really try hard um, whereas with the lute you can spend hours just trying to get the sound right if you're amplifying. Um, and so uh, this, this is built using lots of very modern ideas, new ideas, especially to, around the strutting, which is a, a trade secret I'm not allowed to go into, um, and around some of the materials used. Um, for instance, most of this is held together with carbon fiber rods rather than animal glues. There are no animal glues involved. It's uh, in, entirely okay for vegetarians and vegans to use this instrument um, and uh, the carbon fiber uh, rods are what were used to uh, to hold my loot together when she was rebuilt after being destroyed by um, various airlines one particular German one which we shan't talk about but which begins with the letter L um, and so this is a effectively for me the the the, the start of my, what I call a, a modern renaissance in, in loop playing. And I'm trying to spearhead a, a drive towards 
um, uh, per performing and producing music in different formats and different ways and different mediums that's accessible to ordinary people um, that that is taken up by guitarists um, and non-instrumentalists as well you know, the idea so, sorry i was just gonna say that historically the first 10 course guitar I heard was played by Narcisco Yebes. <laughs> and do we have to talk, do we have to talk about that? No. <laughs> okay. I always hated the sound. Mm -hmm. And the first the first um, ten string instrument that uh, that I thought was superb was the sound of this lutar. So I really have a lot of admiration for this. It also brings to mind that people could say, well, it's the 21st century and this bears no relationship or, uh, to historical instruments. Only in a very small sense could you argue that. I would say that if you take the example of Bach, Bach was someone who was fascinated by all instruments and he worked to invent instruments. His sixth sure. cello suite, for example, was written for a five-string cello. <laughs> he, I didn't. I didn't know you. you I've learned. I always learn something every time I talk to you. But I didn't know that one. Five string cello. And so the fifth string was a perfect fifth above the highest string. Uh -huh. And he was also one of the great technological people, and it is well known he was an expert in organs, organ repair, organ construction. So I think that had this instrument been transported to one of the wonderful evenings that we would all have loved to have been present in when Bach would get together with his friend Silvius Leopold Weiss, I have no doubt that they would both be playing this instrument with great uh, relish and enjoyment. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, I think Bach might not have done. I think he would have. I think he would have sat and watched and and tried to look cool because um, about it all. Because uh, I, my my theory around Bach with the Lautenwerk is that it was that this was an invention um, to a, a, a harpsichord that sounded like a lute. Because although he owned lutes, um, he wasn't a, a very great lute player. Um, and that it would be an instrument that he would play as a keyboard that sounded like a lute. So he could play his lute suites, as we call them now, these pieces that were to see how they would sound before they go out to, to be played on, on, on lutes by people, people like Vice. I, I can see it. So I think he would have sat there and gone, you know, sort of, oh, what woods are the, you know, what woods are involved in this? And, oh, I love the, uh, the idea of the tuning pegs that have a gearbox and, oh, great, this is, you know, this is cool. And, uh, and so he would have said to, to Vice, you know, give us a sonata, Silvius. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, my, my theory, which may be subversive and, and as usual, immersed in the kind of lack of true historical knowledge that I'm blessed with, is that some of Vice's great pieces may have come after evenings of making music with Johann Sebastian Bach. Mm. Some of his music for me, and, and you've corrected me in the past a little bit on this, but some of his music is so, seems so far above his average good Baroque lute music that uh, I thought, well, he probably got some nice inspiration and maybe some cool ideas from <laughs> Johann Sebastian. Uh, I think I think also the other way around. Um, I mean, not wanting to sort of fight the lute player's corner overly, um, unf in, you know, with unfair sort of uh, bias. But there's certainly one. Um, I'm sure from, the, from off the top of my head, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's um, an A major violin sonata of uh, Bach's that is based on a, a, a piece of music by Weiss. Um, You'll probably know which one that is because I know you have a, a, a sort of a, a mental catalogue of every piece of music that was ever written. Um, <laughs> it's, it's on these not, put, not putting you on the spot or anything, you know. But, but uh, I, I think that 
that's all great musicians who who are lucky enough to live within a, a reasonable distance of each other and for for them sort of 30 or 40 miles apart uh, at various points what was uh, wasn't you know wasn't a, a huge distance to worry about was it um, I think they will all take inspiration from each other. And, and I've certainly taken inspiration from, from players who live 30 miles down the road, you know, and you, you sort of find that after you spent an evening playing um, music with somebody that you know who's, who, who gets something different, a different touch out of the music, that you, you tend to play better for a few days. You, you tend to feel an improvement in your own playing. And I think that's part of the, the, if you like, the community of music that, that, that people like you and I try and promote um, rather than it being something that's sort of stuck in someone's bedroom while they're, they're by themselves playing. It's, it's about getting out there and doing stuff, isn't it? Yes. I, I want to interject another time because some people may have recently joined the, the viewing of this, that you have a QA and a um, prompt on the YouTube screen. If you click it, you can types uh, uh, questions. I'm seeing that a number of questions have come in and we'll try to get to that. Ben, I'm just, do you have the, the question queue? Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I like, I like this first comment I've got, which is uh, that it's a very American instrument, a great invention, very American. <laughs> the well, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I think it's, uh, I think it actually, I'm going to get rid of that. There's a, a mobile, or you would call it a cell phone, going off. Um, the peg heads, I think, um, are certainly an American invention, and they are perhaps the the, the most amazing thing for a loop player to come across, <laughs> because we we spend hours of our lives tuning loops, and to to be able to play it sort of with a a one to four mechanism. Um, so you, you can tune the thing in, in in three minutes and it's got this many strings. Fantastic. So it, it would have prolonged my four hour career of playing the lute quite a bit. Uh, if I had that, um, I have a, I have a very fine older flamenco guitar that came with the pegs and I did the sacrilegious thing of having my guitar, uh, person put in the tuning pegs because I knew <sighs> if I had to fight it all the time <laughs> i just wasn't going to play it enough to because the tuning was too much too well, my brother did the exact opposite he took uh, he took a, a guitar that was a, a very nice guitar that had um, um uh, that had you know machine heads and so on and he, he took that and and had it rebuilt as a flamenco guitar with with flamenco style pegs so <laughs> he's done the exact opposite to you hey here's a great question here's a great question Jeffrey, ask Ben how many bad jobs he's had in the past to support his loot addiction. Ask Steve in Florida. <laughs> how many bad loot jobs? How many bad jobs to support his loot addiction? Uh, I can tell you honestly, the answer to that is zero. <laughs> I have never. I no. I, I'm. I've. I've always been a a loot addict who supported himself through loots. <laughs> I bet that's a shocking answer as well. Well, it's a very heartening answer for sure, but I'm, <laughs> well, not, but I'm not shocked. No, not, I, you know, some of us can live on dentals and, and nothing else, you know. But, <laughs> but I was wondering, how did you, how does someone get going in playing the lute when you were much younger? How did you start? Because there aren't too many lute teachers, although there's an abundance mm -hmm. of classical. And yes, because my, my, my younger brother, who's who's now um, pretty well known as a flamenco guitarist, I mean, we, we've toured together ab abroad on, on many occasions. Um, he was learning from uh, guitar locally here in Truro, and uh, his teacher was uh, originally a lute player um, who taught with, uh, you know, some of the, the big names of the day, so people like Anthony Bales and so on. Um, and uh, I didn't want to be the third player so uh, of a guitar in my family. I already had two brothers playing guitar. And uh, so he suggested playing the lute, and, and that's what uh, got me started. And, and, and when I, start, I started, I knew immediately it was what I was going to do for a, for a living. And, uh, and that's what I've done ever since. Were there, were there um, any lutenists who 
were recording or you would see live that that inspired you and influenced you like i was used to see bream when mm -hmm. he came in the 70s he would play his first half on the lute and that was extremely inspiring yes the julian bream was the was the person um that uh, i first heard playing lute and and he he was the person who in the 70s um when i was a child in the 80s was was the person who played the lute as i saw it with aplomb and with uh, um uh, style and charisma you've got the same problem i just had you've got phones going off all over the place now and um, and so and so bream was, bream was the was was the lutinist for me and um as well as the guitarist and um i remember seeing him in concert many times um over here and when i was 18 i was lucky enough to go and play music um at his home and play music for him and we sort of sat and drank earl grey tea together and chatted about music and that was quite a quite an afternoon to remember. I would think so. Wow. Yeah, that's one one I'll be telling my grandchildren about. <laughs> Not that I have any yet. <laughs> so, but yes, Julian Broom was definitely the the um, uh, the person who inspired me the most. And he said, I remember at the time when I met him, I'd had a lot of negativity from various people inside the loop world at the time, and um, about it's the sort of thing you can't make a living at you you have to do something else do this as a hobby you're very good but you know and uh, he said there's no reason at all why you can't do it you know he was very complimentary about my sound he said uh, i always remember the quote he said you you make a a delicate sound gentle but not too soft um and i thought okay he's he's saying nice stuff about me this has got to be a good a good thing and uh well, I saw him. Yeah. I saw Brain give two master classes uh, in California: one in San Francisco in the early '80s, and one quite a f at least ten or fifteen years later in Northridge. And he was a really good teacher, but he was not someone ever to say things nice that were not. <laughs> That's an understatement. I thought, I thought you meant full stop. He never said anything nice, but as long as they were accurate, <laughs> no, that's good. Um, he, yes, I, th I think I, I remember him saying that he didn't really like teaching and that and differentiated that um, from masterclass. The masterclass is very is a very interesting thing. I mean, I've done a lot of those myself, where you where you spend time listening and, and really trying to get to the crux of a problem or, or, or the crux of how to improve someone's playing in, in a short space of time. And it's a much more overall concept than when you're giving, you know, I mean, you've given many lessons over the years. When you give a le lessons, say, on a weekly or monthly or whatever basis to a student, when you see them improve or not, uh, and you're sort of having to talk to them about the same thing, sometimes week in, week out. And the, the masterclass is really a, a different thing to teaching, isn't it? And, and I think um the general teaching uh it fits some people and obviously didn't fit him very well but the master class i think he did, i think his master classes i've seen a, a couple of videos of, of things and, and so i've never seen one live but um I, I think they were very inspiring and i think that's the the job of the the maestro in those situations isn't it you have to strut around and and, and shout and shout things normally but but he managed to get away with without doing that he, he well, managed to get yeah, he had great respect for all the people overall. And he was not averse to getting his hands, digging in immediately in tremendous detail. Or if someone had just a, a, a weak sense of the rhythmic structure or something, yeah, he, would, yeah. he, would, he would immediately go to that essence. So yeah. it was great as an auditor. I just went to see him teach to see the scope, the seriousness, and the passion with which he did everything. And there was a great, there were great lessons and benefits just from that, at least for me. I, I think so. I, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if you want to try and queue up the, the vice and see if you can get that working. Um, but um, I thought it might be interesting as I, I went across town to, to pick up my loot earlier on to, to show you the, the loot at the same time. 
so oh. so if you if you like i can i'll uh, i'll reach across the room and and pick that up go ahead and i will take another shot huh um he's going to find out that there was a button missing off his keyboard there <laughs> I'll, I'll be two ticks I'm going to uh, fill this space a little bit. We're having difficulty getting the YouTube uh, videos playing. I'm sure it's it will be sorted out uh, for for in the future. But for right now, I think it's uh, it's not something that we can really work out live. <laughs> So, here's the loot. Wow. Here's the loot indeed. The, uh, the problem that, uh, that I'll have, I won't be able to play anything on this because uh, in transportation across town, I've got two strings completely unwound, which is the sort of thing that, if I tell you what, getting off an aeroplane, the terror of opening a loot case. Hmm. But, uh, but the, yes, but the, uh, yes, it seems funny. I haven't picked her up for a, a few weeks. Um, so it seems quite a, a strange thing to do, which is, which is good, but um, but still very comfortable. May I ask you, are the frets gut that is tied? That you yes. Slide? Oh yes, yes, yes. I, I'll, I'll show I'll show you the, this the horror of the movable fret. Yes. <laughs> yes, you don't. If if you get the t the tying too loose, you're really in trouble. Uh, of course, you have to put a bit of bee. You have to put up the beeswax. Bit of I don't. You probably can't see that the camera is a little bit too. Uh, oh, you can. Can you see there's a knot? Yeah. Well, the knots have got um, a little dark dob of beeswax melted onto them to try and hold the, the knot in place. But doesn't the the movable fret allow you some slight differences in tuning as well? <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever tune by the position of the fret? No, you you uh, you no you, you you hope that the instrument you're playing um, is of a sufficient quality that the intonation is not completely shot through <laughs> from after the fifth fret, and and as long as you're playing an instrument that is of a sufficient quality, you should be able to get a pretty much perfect perfect pitch throughout by having the frets in the right place. And what happens is um, the there's a slight on on the very cheap lutes, if you like. Um, I remember I, I had I had one to begin with. The, the wood is very, very soft on the fretboard. And you find that you have a, a, a notch appears after a while. <laughs> so you know where the fret should go. And and even on, on a lute like this, which is a pretty exceptional instrument, um, the uh, there is a slight, there's an indent. I can feel it with my finger. I can't even on this, in this case, see it with my naked eye the indent but i can see it's slightly shinier there because it hasn't been exposed to, to to the world it's been covered by fret um and so uh, so you know where the fret should go um i you can see this is a very clean clean instrument i don't if you notice that they're often very sort of green around this sort of area hmm. uh, and that's because the the players have that you rest the, the little finger on when you're when you're playing but uh I, I, I got into this habit from sort of age 13 of, uh, of always washing my hands before I played the lute. <laughs> so you have to be careful. You can end up with some weird OCD stuff with that, but we won't go there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, so yes, this is the instrument I played. This was built by Philip Brown in Newbury in 1985. So this is now 30 years old. Wow. And uh, you can't tell from there that she's been rebuilt, but uh, there was... Um, uh, let's see if I can show you. Can, you. can you see these little snowflakes here? Yes. I don't know if you can see just about. Um, they are they're covering up uh, the ends of carbon fiber rods that are holding the, literally holding this instrument together after when I, I went to play in Slovakia in, in um, oh it must have been two or three years ago and uh, got the, the you know, the instrument came through um, at the airport and I got back to the hotel 
looking at the case and the, the fret board was at an angle to, and the neck was at an angle to the instrument and was sort of shoved inside it, you know, it had been dropped, we reckon it been dropped from a height of at least 30 feet um, this way, <laughs> downwards. And uh, it's a, a testament to the, to the, um, uh, to the, the case uh, um, and and the the way it was built, that there wasn't more damage done. But you know, this is not a this is not the sort of thing that you need to happen when you go to play a, a one-off festival. And uh, it was at Modra Festival um, in Slovakia, and I ended up playing the concert, um, which was with a, a singer um, on a borrowed guitar with a capo on. <laughs> so, wow. It was quite it was quite a quite a, a scary experience for me guitar six strings what do you what can you do with that anyway <laughs> that's that's um that's hard to, i don't even want to think about that yeah that's, that's a scary a scary scenario well that's that is uh fantastic i was going to say that i noticed that you're getting ready for an upcoming uh european tour and uh What's when does that start? And it looks like I think it's primarily in Hungary. Is that correct? Yes, the the Hungary things are are the the, the important um, part of my of my summer. Really, uh, I'm spending some days doing the master classes. Um, I'm going next week. Next weekend, this time next week, I'll be I'll be in Budapest, um, which is one of few European capitals I haven't played in before. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I, the, I think the concerts are the, are the Tuesday and Wednesday after I arrive. But I'm also uh, I'm in Gyeonggyosh playing on the folklore, folklore festival, um, and um, I, I don't know what that's going to be like. Except I made sure that the the venue is air conditioned, so <laughs> because I'm told it's going to be very hot. And I have some days of master classes there, which will be very interesting as cool. well. And then uh, and then when I get back from there, I'm. I'm I'm sort of calling in in a couple of places on the way there and back, but uh, then after the main the main focus then of, of my summer is going to be around um, a duet concerts with um, Andrea Dietri, um, Italian maestro who happens to be one of my best friends, and he's coming over at the end of next month to play four concerts down here in Cornwall, um, which will come from one of my. One of my books that's not yet published, um, four volumes of Luke duets from the 1580s up to around 1615. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so th that's hopefully coming out at some point in, in August to September. And the concerts are going to promote that partly, but also because I've known Andrea sort of over 15 years and we've we stayed in each other's houses and, um, you know, we've sort of got, gone to the beach together and, 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 and had dinner together and spent days together. We've never actually played much music together. We, we played a few duets over breakfast when he was here last year and decided we'd do some concerts. So this is the first time. That so I have 20-odd 20, 20 pieces to learn that in the next month <laughs> that's a, that I don't know at the moment. We'll see. How, I'll report back to you about that. <laughs> Very cool. I thought I would uh, try another feature that's called screen share, and I have a poster that uh, for the Hungarian festival. We can refer back to that, and I just thought I might bring it up for a moment. So here. Do you I think it, will it work? Will it work? Let's see. It works. Ah. Very nice. Here we go. This is Gyeonggyosh. And uh, I'm not sure what it says I'm doing, but it looks like the sort of thing I'd be going to. <laughs> I'll be there anyway, July the 28th. Oh, I think Baratok Temploma is probably the place where I'm playing at uh, 7 p.m. July the yeah. 28th, that's in nine days. So that, yeah, that's, uh, that sounds about right. That's the Tuesday concert. Um, and then the following day, um, I'm, I think, in Budapest, um, which I think is also a seven o'clock concert. And in between, I'm doing lots of um, classes and so on, trying to talk about uh, interpretation of vice and uh, working on um, people's Renaissance ornamentation, um, how, to, how you can play Renaissance music successfully on guitar. Um, the answer is buy a lute. Uh, 
<laughs> you can, of course. You, I, I, I'm being told you you can actually play Renaissance music very successfully on guitar. The, the main the main criteria are love of the music and a guitar that has a nice tone. And if you've got those, and ideally a capo, so you can whack it on the third fret for a G tuning, then mm-hmm. then you've got a good a good start. Uh, One of the things. Uh, about your program that that I saw on a different uh, different page, that you're gonna, it seems that you're going to be beginning your concerts your concert in Hungary with improvisations, and can you can you talk about the I'm very interested in the role of improvisation in Renaissance and Baroque periods, and how mm-hmm. do you approach that for your own concerts? Well. Uh... It's a bit of a strange one, really, because I'm never, I don't consider myself an expert in improvisation by any means. Um, It's sort of just something that you either can do or can't do, as I saw it when I started. And uh, as as you know, uh, my young brother's a flamenco guitarist, and and (laughs) what they don't know about improvisation is, is not worth talking about on the whole. And yet if you question them about how do you improvise they don't, they tend to sort of look at you quite blankly as though you're a bit mad for asking the question um, I, i'm the same with renaissance stuff you have a skeleton a skeleton sort of outline um i don't know if you've got anything from i've got a um a book out which is uh, some renaissance solos which can complete with extra sets of divisions as the renaissance people call them and variations and, and you have the skeletal outline and, and you sort of put meat onto the bones in many regards and with the improvisational stuff that I, I do um, in concert it tends to be that I use um, a, a, maybe a short series of, uh, of pieces such as early dance tunes some brannels from the 16th century or something like this um, and I join them together in weird and wonderful ways, or certainly weird and wacky ways, um, and and play play the music with uh, just each time a little bit differently. Um, and that can include things like uh, d- getting different sound effects, like bass damping. Um, it can in- include um, uh, dividing up um, the s- slower notes into series, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, into sl- a series of shorter notes, so longer notes into shorter notes, uh, division writing as we call it, um, and sometimes incorporating some quite modern styles of, of, of playing. So some, I, I remember on one occasion, there's a, the Packington's Pound, for instance, I've done a, uh, did a, a version in a concert which had a, uh, on the middle section, had a, like a, a blues bass background thing, uh, going on so you know sort of using a scale with blue notes in it and and, and just making something something different out of what you have to, to keep the music fresh more than anything else and also because it can be kind of boring to to play a set program where you know exactly what's going to happen and you even know where, which bits you have to um, stretch a little bit harder on you know to get the right notes I, I like the I like the unknown a little bit more and um, you get much more of a, a rush. It's also my, my only form of exercise. You know, I have to, you have to get the heart beating very fast <laughs> at some points in your life. And, <laughs> and improvising in concert is, is one of those ways, especially solo where there's no one else that you can't just stop and look chilled while somebody else carries on. There's nobody else there. So you're, <laughs> you're doing it all yourself. <laughs> well, Segovia was uh, later in his life, he still gave great concerts in Los Angeles, but occasionally when he would forget something, he would stop and glare out into the audience as if someone had offended him with an extra noise. Now I might I might steal that idea and use that. Yeah. <laughs> and he did it with 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 great effect, and it really was a good part of the performance to be able to share with him. <laughs> on the books, I on your a collection of Renaissance solos, I'm going to um, do another screen share of this, and I think we'll see uh, actually three excerpts from the books. Yeah, we're seeing three. We see, we're seeing three. Yeah, three. Uh, three different books shown up there. Yes. And you were discussing the a collection of Renaissance solos. I do. I do have that book. 
and it's absolutely wonderful for guitarists. It is an invitation to learn uh, to learn to become more comfortable f uh, with tablature, but particularly your imp your improvised uh, additions to the pieces is a it's a really wonderful reflection on the originals and gives it does give a sense of how open these pieces are rather than closed bits of museum jewelry in cases. That's one yeah, of the yes, dangers. I, I agree with you. I, I, the, the, the thing I, I would point out to people who are listening as well is that when, because you, you refer to them as, as improvised um, divisions in there and, and in fact most of the time written down divisions are not improvised but um, these ones were because they were written in a single take if you like without being corrected or anything else um, and it was simply a matter of I'm going to play this write down what I played and print and so they are literally um, divisions that were devised on the spur of the moment and and, and um, put into print format and, and published by my publishers. I have, I have on the screen share um, your website. And for anyone who's listening, who has interest in uh, these kinds of things, it's a great website. And I'm just going to scroll through pages. The link to the website is in, will be included in the video that we post after this. And it also may be in uh, your current screen. But there's a home page which has a, a nice biography of Ben. There is a page about the Lutar itself that Ben was discussing with photographs of it in construction and so forth. Uh, then I'm going to skip over some. There's a gallery of photos. I'm hoping to see some of the cats in there at some point. <laughs> so they have their own Facebook page. You don't have to worry. You can see as many photos as you want. Yes. <laughs> then there's a wonderful page for the videos that, that I wasn't able to access for everybody. There's a wonderful page of uh, Ben's videos of various kinds, including this one here that I'm highlighting, which is um, Ben and Andrea, um, doing some practicing and playing of a uh, canon by Francesco de Milano. The funny thing is the, the take my dining table, which we're, we're playing at there is, is actually, it was actually made roughly in the same year as that piece was written. So the, the dining table is uh, early 16th century and we played early 16th century music at it. So that was kind of yes. nice feeling for me. So if you are, a big aficionado, for instance, of Giuliani, you need to get a dining room table. Yeah. Circa 1809. Exactly. And spread your Giuliani scores on that. Yeah. Um, among, I think for me, one of the most exciting parts of what Ben has been doing is the publications. And we had already looked at this page a little bit. I'll scroll down just as a quick view there's this Bach collection that is being added to, but there's wonderful uh, version of the, the Fugue, uh, BWV 1000, Prelude Fugue and Let It Grow, BWV 998, and uh, performance version of the suite. These are lute players editions, but I might, I, I should say that as a, <clears throat> As a guitarist, one of the things that is most difficult is for us to find really reliable editions that have scholarship, but also have been created by people who actually play the music. And so these are wonderful resources. They do ask of anyone who's looking at them to uh, understand the tablature notation well enough. But with that in mind, these are these are wonderful resources, and I, I really recommend them tremendously to all, everybody. Uh, we'll, we're going to put, uh, well, I think that within Ben's website, since it's all there, there are links to the public publishers that, that uh, sell the book, and they're available. I live in Los Angeles. They very successfully sent uh, me some of the books over 
uh, over the ocean. So they are accessible, I think, to everybody. I was going to say, they, they send a special person on horseback to, in, a, in a rowing boat, <laughs> right across, and then he galloped across the United States. And it was still there with, with you within two years, I think, wasn't it? So that's pretty good. <laughs> um, it seemed like a long time. And then once it got here, it seemed like no time at all. But that's, <laughs> that's the trick of sending anything overseas or to different continents. If it actually gets in the person's hand, that's successful. Forget, forget. Absolutely. That. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely right. Well, I think that this has been a really great um, hour, approximately an hour of conversation. And I want to thank Ben for all the things that uh, we have gone over and that he shared with us. For those of you who uh, have attuned, you can check YouTube and we'll post some information as well and Facebook and so forth so that you can, if you wish, you can go over the interview or parts of the interview because there's so much in value for many, many people. It's, uh, thank, thanks so much, Ben, for doing this. I feel it's going to be of great benefit to many, many players over a long time to kind of get to know you, the approach that you have to loot and lutar and that Renaissance and Baroque music. And it's been really a great honor for, for us to have you with us today. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great to be here. Good. I'll say goodbye to everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll hopefully catch up together later.